Yeah, an important topic in applied microbiology is, of course, fighting microorganisms, fighting against my bacteria or fighting against viruses. And now in the corona crisis, of course, this is of a special importance. So let's go. Yeah, we've already talked about fighting against bacteria. Now let's have a look on how it is possible to fight against viruses. And as you want to become scientists, we um, look at, of course, what are the options to fight viruses in general. But in now with this corona crisis, we want to see what are the special options with respect to fighting corona. What could be potential targets? And we want to look at it in a scientific way. So we want to analyze also primary scientific data to be able to judge how these options can be considered. And second, uh, we want to have a look on, um, everybody is now talking about Corona. Whom should you listen to? Whom should you trust? Cure has uh, many things which differ uh, from eukaryotic cell. The cells look different. Uh, it has a different metabolism. And of course, antibiotics, uh, which we have, Uh, attack different things of bacterial synthesis. So penicillin, as a as a uh, as as I said, targets cell wall synthesis, and all bacteria have all the major part of bacteria have a cell wall which are clinically relevant. So therefore, the cool thing is that, that penicillin therefore works, or ampicillin derivatives, which also work in gram negatives, work for a vast array of bacteria. But now, actually, we have corona. So uh, it's a virus. So an antibiotics will not work in a, in a virus because um, a virus has no cell wall. A virus has no, um, has no own metabolism. So the question is, how can we treat, in principle, viral infections? And to answer that, we have to look first on how a virus looks like. So this is a slide you have already seen. So this is a slide uh, where uh, we have uh, DNA viruses and RNA viruses, and we have the principal difference uh, uh, how a virus could look like. We can have naked viruses. A naked virus is a virus which has the nucleic acid and a capsid. Remember, a virus always has either RNA or DNA. Bacteria have both. Of course, eukaryotic cells have also both, either RNA or DNA, and then you have this nucleocapsid around. Now, an envelope virus has, in addition, an envelope which is composed of a membrane, and in this envelope, you have usually gly glycoproteins which range out of this envelope, and these glycoproteins are the point where this virus docks then to the target cell. So this is the structure of the virus. And you see the structure of the virus is already quite simple. Uh, and in this case, simple doesn't make us too happy because simple means there is not much to attack here. Yeah? Um, the other uh, thing is, um, so this is the structure and uh, a very helpful uh, scheme to classify our viruses is the so-called Baltimore classification. And this Baltimore classification is a classification scheme on how the virus gets to the RNA. And um, this is helpful because this um, makes also gives you some points of attack, potential points of attack. So we have different classes of viruses. And of course, we, the, the, the simplest from the scheme is a double-strand DNA virus. A double-strand DNA virus is the same as a eukaryotic cell because you have a double-strand DNA and you have a transcription and then you come to your mRNA. So he can, this virus can use the complete cell and machinery for coming from the double-strand RNA to the mRNA. Now we have single-strand DNA viruses. These viruses first need to synthesize this double-strand DNA and then you can get to mRNA. This is class two. Then class three, we have double-strand RNA viruses. So in this case, if it's a double-strand, we have both plus and minus RNA. So um, you have directly your mRNA also. Uh, replication, of course, you need to have a RNA replicase. Single-strand RNA viruses, you can either have plus or 
minus single strand RNA viruses. So uh, plus means that you can directly do a transcription, but you need a minus strand in order to get the matrix to form the mRNA. And for minus RNA, you can directly replicate the mRNA from that. And then we have single strand RNA viruses, which are first reverse crumb tra transcribed to DNA, and then we form double strand DNA, and this is then going to RNA. And then we have a very special group also. We have double strand DNA viruses, um, which also have a cycle inside uh, where you have a reverse transcription. So the replication of these viruses has in addition a reverse transcription. So the new double strand DNA is formed from RNA. It's hepatitis B virus, for example, in this case. So this is the classification scheme and you can talk hours for a viral replication schemes. So this is a, a, a vast zoo and divergency of how viruses replicate. Um, so you see that uh, viruses are way more variant with respect to their um, replication scheme than, uh, than bacteria, for example. And this, of course, makes it more difficult to find a point where you can attack. But where can you attack at all? And there are several um, uh, point of attack. So if you have a virus which has a reverse transcriptase, you can try to block, for example, this reverse transcriptase. And of course, this has been done. In this list, you see mainly viruses uh, which are uh, relevant in the Western world. You see hardly viruses which mainly affect the third world. Why? Very simple, because pharmaceutical companies, of course, earn money with these viruses and not with the others. Yeah, this is the simple reason. Yeah. So we have now a virus uh, where, which are act on the fusion of the uh, particle with the membrane, so-called fusion inhibitors uh, uh, against HIV, for example. Now, this is, um, I, I will go back to these in a, in a couple of seconds. Um, Neuramidase inhibitors, it's a very specific um, a step in the influenza replication. This is Tamiflu. Um, now we have uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are just not uh, nucleoside based um, and they block the reverse transcriptase. Of course, also HIV. Then we have nucleoside analogs. So the same as we have seen in the bacteria at the very beginning. Of course, also while replication relies on uh, uh, nucleotides, nucleosides or the bases. And you can make base analogs or nucleoside analogs or nucleotide analogs, uh, which are just recognized by the viral enzymes and therefore will block the viral enzyme or the viral uh, will, will interfere with viral replication and not human replication. So the arts here is find an agent which only acts in uh, the virus and not interferes with human DNA replication or transcription. Yeah. Uh, and this is just also an, an, a list of um, um, agents which has been uh, discovered or which has been um, developed. And you see also here we have a, a array of agents which um, also work against reverse transcriptase, but there are others which work against herpes virus, acyclovir, for, for example, and um, HCV. Um, and we have nucleotide analogs, of course, um, like uh, Cidovir, Remdesivir, um, they work against uh, also the polymerase. So nucleotide, nucleoside, again, it's the phosphate, which is the difference. Nucleoside has no phosphate, nucleotides have the phosphate. Um, for example, ATP is a nucleotide. Yeah? Protease inhibitors, RNA virus, especially RNA viruses, they form an mRNA, and usually this is just one mRNA which is formed because only few viruses have a segmented, RNA viruses have a segmented genome. Influenza has that, for example. So these uh, RNA viruses produce one mRNA, and in eukaryotic cells, you have no polycystronic RNA. So therefore, uh, this mRNA in general will form one protein. And of course, you need to have several proteins. Uh, although a vi even a virus is simple, one protein is not enough. You need a po you need to have a polymerase. You need to have uh, um, capsid proteins. You might, if you're enveloped, you need to have a glycoprotein. So you need to have at least three or four proteins, and you need to form that from this one precursor. This can be done by several strategies. Uh, you can have a variability in splicing, for example, but. In, in most viruses, you have also the uh, a protease which will cleave this precursor protein into certain proteins which are then used and then are um, 
in, uh, then are let's say applied. Yeah. Um, so um, this is and therefore you can of course inhibit then this protease which is required. And an example are these drugs which are again employed in HIV. Why do they have so many different agents against HIV? Isn't it enough to use one? Next problem with viruses, usually they can mutate quite quickly. And if you have just one agent, it's for the virus quite easy to escape. But if you have three or four agents at the same time, even for a virus with a high mutation frequency, it's merely impossible. That's the reason why now, if you have today HIV infection and you live in the Western world and not a country without a, a good health system, it's at present really no problem to suppress this infection because you will get a combined treatment with a couple of HIV um, agents. Nevertheless, it's good not to get HIV and protect yourself. That's always the smarter way. And you just uh, sexual transmitted is not just HIV. There are also other diseases. Yeah. So protecting yourself is better than treating later on. Um, now we come to uh, pyrophosphate analogs. Okay, this is a, a, again a special uh, case. RNA polymerase inhibitors like rifamycin and again, uh, synthetic amines. Now, coming back to the interference, um, interference are very special because interference are when you when you join the immunology lecture in the four, fourth or fifth semester, um, you will learn about uh, how the immune system works and an important actor in the immune system are interference. And interference, um, uh, interferon gamma, for example, is activating uh, a certain type of immune cells. Interferon beta is an interferon which is different and interferon alpha to some extent. These interferons can um, um, activate an antiviral state of cells. So if this interferon is around, cells are more resistant in a general way against um, against viral infection. However, um, if you apply these interference um, systemically, uh, they are highly toxic because uh, usually these uh, interference are produced locally at the site of infection. But if I have uh, now a viral infection, I cannot inject at 1000 positions my interference. So I have to apply it um, systemically and this makes quite a bunch of side effects. Okay, um, but now let's talk about Coronavirus. So, what about coronavirus? How can we uh, uh, attack uh, the coronavirus? If you want to do something against coronavirus, you first need to look at what, um, how is the replication cycle of coronavirus. So, these are the replication cycles of the SARS uh, coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus. So, the actual coronavirus, SARS CoV 2, resembles the replication. Um, a cycle of the original SARS virus. This figure is from a publication in 2019 where the actual coronavirus was not yet uh, present, but the replication cycle uh, looks similar. Now, the SARS coronavirus uh, first adapts to a receptor called ACE2 uh, and then is engulfed and in the lysosome you have a membrane fusion. So this is an essential step for a virus that the membrane fuses and that the genomic material then is released. Uh, the coronavirus has a plastrin RNA, is a plastrin RNA virus, and this then needs to be replicated. So you can directly uh, translate it, and you have then uh, a pro the first protein which is formed is this PP1A, PP1AB, and then you have a proteolysis step, and then you have uh, the formation of a replicase. And this replicase then can replicate the uh, plus RNA strand to a minus RNA strand. This minus RNA strand then can uh, replicate, uh, can be transcribed to different RNAs. So this is one genomic RNA and you have a uh, variable transcription here giving uh, constructs of a different length and these then encode uh, these different um, viral proteins which then of course are translated. You translate that um, into the endoplasmatic reticulum as you see and the assembly and balloting happens directly there. And then you have the virus release. So this is um, the replication cycle of sars uh, corona. So you see already we have talked about proteolysis. So you need to have an enzyme which have a proteolytic activity. You have a viral replicate. So these are attack uh, points of attack. And of course, uh, you can now look um, simply what agents could have an activity against SARS um, because they... Um, they act against um, 
features uh, which are also present. And the first thing you do is you don't develop a new agent because if you want to develop, of course you could do that. You could start to screen with a high throughput screening, which where I, you remember that I told you I worked in a pharmaceutical company. We have HTS screening, so you could develop an assay. You could uh, recombinantly express um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 replicates, for example, and screen with a high throughput screening agents, which are specific for this uh, uh, poly um, uh, RNA polymerase. This is possible and for sure will also be done. However, to develop such an agent and, and bring it on the market, this will take ye many years. So um, this is something which doesn't help us in the actual epidemics because it's way too long uh, to go from with such an approach uh, uh, to the market and it means that we can really go to the hospital and treat the patients. Um, so therefore the first thing you do is you look in the list I've shown you before and look into agents which could work. So of course nucleoside analogs could work and then you just test. You just test whether these agents have some activity in vitro and then of course they're candidates you could try in the clinics. Yeah? And there are some examples which are now discussed are this sophosbuvir and ribavirin um, which are nucleoside analogs and they are then they show some activity in in vitro assays against uh, a coronavirus uh, and then you would develop them and try to develop them um, against uh, corona in the clinics to try we'll come to that um, we have one inhibitor which is remdesivir uh, which is an inhib uh, which is a nucleotide analog inhibiting the viral polymerase and this also looks like it has some activity it uh, seems to be promising this has been developed against ebola but it has not yet been approved so the um, the not been approved so the activity against ebola was not as uh, uh, good as the first results promising results suggested. Uh, there are protease inhibitors and also these, I said the virus has this protease step, so you need to, uh, uh, it's requiring this protease. So these two, uh, uh, lopinavir and duaronavir, which are inhibitors against the HIV proteases, also seem to show some activity against coronavirus, so also these one are promising. Um, this is, let's say, what you what you also read in the press. Ah, remdesivir shows some activity. Uh, let's try it. But your job is you need to be able to really analyze the data. You need to look at primary data in, in order to judge is this true or not. You don't just read newspapers. You need to come up with your own opinion. Yeah? And this is what I want to show you now with an example how you can... Uh, based on primary data, how can you conclude and how can you then deduce what to do? Now, I want to come now to this part here. This is this first step where you have an attachment of the virus to the receptor and then at this step where you have this membrane fusion and the RNA release. Very obvious, this is not part of the lecture now, is if you block this attachment, we will talk about that if we talk about vaccines. If you block this attachment here, um, then of course uh, the complete cycle is gone. So if you have an antibody which recognizes the surface protein, um, then you block the replication. This is what they do actually. They extract from patients who have um, uh, who have recovered from the disease, they now extract the antibodies from the blood and try to reinfund them because the intention is here to block this step. And this is, of course, also the intention of a vaccine. You want to just produce antibodies blocking this step. So that's quite straightforward. But now we talk about the step here. You see that uh, the uh, the virus doesn't fuse with the cytoplasmic membrane at that position. There are viruses who do that. It fuses after internalization and this internalization is then the fusion happens within the membrane vesicle and then the fusion happens and the special thing is that this uh, requires then it doesn't happen uh, spontaneously but it requires the activity of proteases cellular proteases which are present in this compartment so only then you have this membrane fusion and of course then you can study whether you can block now these proteases, which are the cellular proteases, and whether this would inhibit this replication. And there we look in a 
very recent publication. The example I want to show you um, is um, this publication here. This is a publication from last week. This is a publication from the group of Stefan Pöhlmann, Markus Hoffmann. And you see here on this paper, you also have this Christian Drosten. And uh, I would say the German students certainly will know him. Uh, Christian Drosten is now, I would say, the number one person you see in TV explaining us COVID infection. And he can do that because he's a real expert in this field. We will come to that in a couple of seconds. Now, SARS, uh, the paper is called SARS-CoV-2 uh, cell entry events on ACE2. This is the receptor you have, I have already told, shown you in the slide before. Um, and this is a protease which is um, expressed in this uh, endosomal Uh, compartment, which is required then, this protease is required for the fusion of this virus with the, uh, with the membrane in order that it releases the clinical material. This is published in Cell, so this is a very high impact publication. It's not just, just another corona publication, it's a very high impact publication. And I want to look with you on the data actually. So what your job is, it's, 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 this is open access, so you can download this publication and have a look on the complete publication, warmly invited, not yet the homework, do it. Um, you need to learn to analyze the data. There are many, many pictures in this publication. I just want to show you a couple of them uh, just to explain to you how you can analyze them. So this is the data of figure four. So of course, in the figures before, they have shown it's important, this uh, uh, this TMPRSS. Uh, but now, of course, the question is, can you block that? So there are two proteases, KTPL and this TMPRSS2 um, in the endosome, which are which they have shown to be relevant for this fusion process. And um, now let's have a look. They measure the entry in this assay. 100% is always the, uh, the control with the same virus. So if you don't treat, so of course here with the control virus, you don't see any effect. Now with SARS, um, if uh, you have a, a, a normal entry, 100%. Now if you add agents which block this AE64D blocks Kate BL, so this protease, Camostat blocks TPMRSS2. So if you use uh, this agent, either just E64DE or Camostat, you have some inhibition. In case of Camostat, it's highly uh, spe uh, specific. And if you use both, you almost completely block that. This is uh, true for this original SARS virus, which was described before, and the actual SARS virus, it's the same. Yeah, So you could almost block it down to almost zero. It's not zero, it's almost zero. Now this is a cell line which has this ACE2 receptor and which has been transformed with it. Uh, on the original cell line does not express um, this TMPRSS2 um, protease, but this cell line has been recombinantly uh, transformed to express it. So this is data from, again, from this publication. By the way, always for you later on, if you make presentations, it's important. Uh, if you use data from another publication, you always, in, on each picture, include the reference. It's not your data. You're talking about data from another group, always include the reference. Yeah. Um, And this is just the figure legend I just I just copied. Okay, so this figure shows that you can inhibit uh, this entry um, using uh, these inhibitors. New scientists, uh, you need to understand the figure. So you need, it means you need to understand what did they do in order to interpret whether this data is valid or not. It's not enough just to look at the figure. It's important to understand what they do. So in other words, What do they do here? What is VSVG? What is SARS virus? And so on. So they work with um, uh, the controls. I think we don't have time. So today obviously takes longer. Not next time it will be shorter, I promise. Um, now, what do they do? So uh, they use pseudotype viruses. These are not the complete SARS virus. This are, these are pseudotype viruses. So they have a virus which is called the VSV virus, vesiculostomalatitis virus. Um, and this virus um, is, um, it's, it's not, a, um, not an unevil virus, but it's a relatively unproblematic virus to be 
um, to be used in the lab. And um, this virus has been modified in a way that the glycoprotein, which is the surface protein here, has been deleted in the genome of this virus and it has been replaced by a green fluorescence protein. So as soon as this virus gets into a cell, the cell will be green. So you can simple, simply measure cell entry by measuring the level um, of green fluorescence. That's, that makes it very nice. Now, if you have replaced the, the surface glycoprotein of this virus, this will not infect cells anymore. So what you have to do is you will have to express this virus in a cell line which at the same time also expresses in parallel uh, this G protein. Then you can um, restore these viral particles. What you do now in the next step is you infect uh, with this cell a cell line um, in this case, it's a paper on hepatitis C virus. By the way, I worked uh, during my diploma thesis in Siena. I worked on hepatitis C virus. Therefore, I like this picture very much because my friends E1 and E2 are here. These are surface proteins of the hepatitis C virus. And uh, of course, they, this has nothing to do with corona. It's just to explain you the system. And it's very interesting because at these times, uh, uh, the effects we have seen hinted towards a mechanism of budding which was new at that time that they budded into um, a compartment which must be in between the endoplasmatic reticulum and the Golgi vesicle and that's the same now also for coronavirus and that's what the first what we have seen there by the way. This is I don't want to tell you how many years ago because if I tell it to you it looks like I'm old and um, as you see here with such a hairstyle, I cannot be old. Okay, so these are the surface proteins. So what you do is you infect uh, the cells with the virus. They will turn green, by the way, because of the GFP protein. And at the same time, you transfect the cells with a vector uh, encoding for E1, E2, surface proteins of the hepatitis C virus. And if you then express both in the same cell, uh, cells, although that doesn't happen here on the surface, it doesn't matter, um, the cells... Um, you will generate virus particles which have, uh, um, which is composed of this vesiculostomatitis virus, complete with the exception of the glycoprotein because this has been deleted. And the surface protein now has been substituted by the E1 and E2 protein of this VSV virus. And you can do the same now, of course, if you use instead of E1 and 2 from hepatitis uh, C, you can use, of course, now the surface protein of coronavirus. And you can use the surface protein of the um, coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV, the original one, but you can use the, uh, of course, also from the surface protein of the actual coronavirus. So you produce then a virus particle which resembles the new coronavirus, at least with respect to the surface protein. And then you can... That can, you can easily study infection because you can look at um, whether um, this then can, uh, and to what extent, this can infect the target cell. Um, and again, you'd simply measure whether the cell turns green. Now, the cool thing is this target cell, the virus particles which will be produced in this virus uh, particles, uh, target cell will be devoid of any um, surface proteins here. So these particles are no more infective because they lack uh, the G, uh, uh, glycoprotein from the original VSV virus and you don't have the genetic information for E1, E2 or the surface protein of coronavirus. So these are non-infective. My question to you, what is the advantage, the technical advantage of such a system if you work with such a system in the lab, if you work with let's say, highly um, uh, pathogenic viruses uh, if you use such a system? Um, so that's the system behind, but of course this is a pseudotype system. And uh, the next example is, so this, we come back now, this is just the explanation of the system. We have understood the system now, and now we look at, again, entry inhibition. Now what is important from a pharmacological point of view is, to what extent can you block the entry? So um, this is, uh, again, the control. So the VSV virus, of course, is not blocked uh, by it's not uh, um, sensitive to these agents, but the MERS, SARS, and uh, the new SARS virus, um, there the CAMOSTAT, this agent inhibiting TMPRSS2, um, 
of course inhibits the entry which has been shown yeah, in this in this cell line in this case it's a different cell line it's a lung cell line by the way uh, just uh, just to remark, Kalu cells. When I read the list of the authors, I said, "Oh, I don't know anyone." But this Kalu cell I read um, came from in the material methods section of this paper. Came from the lab of Stefan Ludwig, and this is someone I I know. I worked together with him during my time in Würzburg, and there he had a Nature Medicine paper where he showed that. Uh, simple aspirin can block uh, replication of influenza virus in this case because it can inhibit NF kappa B and NF kappa B is required for the replication and since this publication I always use aspirin if I um, uh, think I have an influenza infection but usually I'm vaccinated each year against um, influenza only if I forget it I'm not vaccinated because that's the way easier way to avoid uh, the things here. So just that as a as a remark. Now coming back to um, the coronavirus. So we have uh, we have now just a different dosage of this camostat, and you see that the activity is in the micromolar or uh, weekly sub nanomolar range. This is important to see that because um, often this is not present in these papers. I'm coming from the pharmaceutical industry uh, or I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a couple of years and often you see figures like this and you see then that the agents inhibit in the range of, of 50 micromolars or so. These are concentrations you will never ever reach in an in vivo setting. So this uh, such an agent without additional modification is completely useless. So in the pharmaceutical industry, if I make a high throughput screening, I start with agents uh, for further development, which come at least to a single digit micromolar range of the activity. And these agents then are further optimized because at the end, optimally, I want to achieve a single digit nanomolar activity. This is then something I want to see. This is not always possible, but I want to be clearly sub micromolar. And if you have an activity which is not sub micromolar, uh, it's very likely that it doesn't work in, in vivo. So it it at least you have an EC50 vi virus which comes close to that. So there is a chance that this agent really can inhibit and block the entry. Okay, now, um, Controls are important. So this is a pseudotype. This is this is cool, a cool system which makes it easy to work with. But at the end, we want to inhibit the real virus. So it's important to include a control where you have um, uh, an, an experiment with a real virus. Whether it's more difficult to treat or not, it doesn't matter, but you need to see that. And they have it. So in this experiment, they have infected the cells uh, with an, an inoculum of um, uh, this concentration. So this is the, um, uh, the these are the units uh, uh, where you can again infect cells, um, and then you infect the cells, wash them, and then you analyze the uh, viral load in the supernatant. And then obviously, directly after the wash step, uh, you have reduced the amount of uh, viruses in the supernatant tremendously. And after 24 hours, uh, the cells have been infected, and again, they, they start to produce viruses. And you see uh, in the camostat uh, treated group, um, you are well, it's around about 50-fold reduction um, in uh, with respect to virus production. But you see, uh, we talk here always about log scales. This is important. So uh, it, before you, the percentages before are always linear scales. So it looks cool if you have a 99% reduction. But in a log scale, a 99% reduction is just here. It could be that this is not sufficient to block uh, the disease. This depends. It's okay. So we have a 50, f around about 54 or even a bit more. So it's, it's hard to see that, that de detailed on this uh, scheme. But it, whether it's sufficient or not, you can only see in the clinics. But at least it's a highly specific and highly relevant reduction. Yeah, also with the virus. More controls. Does it depend on expression? So here, what they did here is uh, they use two cell lines. It's a 293T cell uh, line. line um, and uh, this has been transfected with ACE2. This cell line do, does not express uh, uh, TMPRSS2. So in this case, if you have this cell line, um, Camostat doesn't work because Camostat does uh, just attack 
TMPRSS2, and this is not present in the cell. And it's good to see that this is the case because um, this proves that it's the target is really TMPRSS2 and not something else. Yeah, and uh, this is just another cell line that you just ju don't use just one cell line. You show it's not cell line specific. You have the same similar effect also in another cell line that's important and now it's not just just killing the cell so the effect in these kalu cells is not just you that camus that kills the cell so this you see that if you do um, if you increase the concentrations of uh, camostat the cells themselves are still happy so there is no effect on the cell it's really an uptake effect and not a killing effect so in science, controls are in most cases more important than the experiment. So here in this paper, it's a cell paper. It's very beautiful. So I really recommend it to read it. Uh, it's one week old. It's very fresh. Um, uh, it's the controls, of course, are there. And I just put some controls. I just put maybe what you have seen is, I don't know, 5% of the data. I just wanted to show you how to read it. Okay, and now it's also important that you don't base your uh, conclusion, especially with therapy, on just one experimental system. So what we have seen is all um, based on inhibiting with Camostat um, this TMPRSS2. This is one mode of action of inhibiting this TMPRSS2. It would be nice to see if you have another way of inhibiting proteolytic activity in the endosome, whether then you also have an inhibition. And that's what they did here in this experiment. This is in the supplemental figure. This is not even in the in the paper itself. So here they have two cell lines and what they did is they inhibited another way the proteases. In this case they inhibited uh, the proteases by inhibiting acidification in the lysosome because the activity of this proteases is dependent on um, an acidic pH. So if you block acidification you block protease activity and therefore uh, you expect also to block the entry. And this is the case. You see that this is a virus here. Uh, honestly, I forgot uh, the name. New virus, maybe you don't know. Um, which fuses not in the endosome, which can fuse directly at the cytoplasmic membrane. So in this case, this is independent from all endosomal proteases because there is no endosome formed. It form goes, it binds to the um, cytoplasmic membrane and directly fuses. Yeah. So in this case, it's completely independent of this acidification because it's no effect. However, uh, the SARS viruses, so the initial one and the actual coronavirus, uh, they are blocked. In other words, um, this proves that it's really these proteases and not whatever effect what you have overseen. So that's very nice to have a very good um hint towards that this camostat could indeed be an agent which is valuable for uh, as a treatment uh, option against um, a coronavirus and again camostat is already an approved agent which is used in a different setting but this is could be tried to be exploited in this setting now but this is an uh, here in this experiment we talk about inhibiting acidification and now you remember should we listen to the number one virologist in the world? So, by the way, I talk about this one. So, this is at least he claims to be the number one virologist in the world. And you might remember what he said um, a couple of weeks ago. He said, use chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Yeah? Chloroquine is used for mal malaria prophylaxis and treatment. And uh, some effects of this chloroquine is chloroquine actually inhibits endosomal pH acidification. You have seen before that pH acidification in the endosome is related to uptake. It interferes with glycosylation of host receptor proteins, which could also interfere then with the uptake, and it has anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Therefore, this chloroquine could have potential broad range of antiviral activity. And if you look at this picture, you would say, it's, it's reasonable um, at least to test chloroquine, which I still consider as reasonable. But now the point is, this is the difference between a scientist uh, who is in the field and someone who just has read for first time such a picture. So if you just look at this picture, you would conclude, yeah, chloroquine. Trump is right, use chloroquine. We have here the data. This is scientifically found. However, 
Now I bring you a citation of uh, Professor Hoffmann and Spinner, which was recently published in the uh, Deutsche Ärzteblatt. They looked at uh, therapeutic options um, against coronavirus, so that they just did not just look at chloroquine, but also others. And I like the sentence. They uh, to cited a positive effect of chloroquine, which was tested for decades in a multitude of viral diseases without success, would be the first of this kind. In other words, um, it's of course, it's a good idea to go because you have this data, you have an effect of uh, uh, inhibiting pH, though therefore it is of course worth it uh, to look whether chloroquine works or not. However, if you know that it has never worked before, although other viruses rely on the same mechanism of action, it's very risky to expose patients uh, with a completely untested drug um, with respect to this uh, mechanism uh, to the risk of the side effect because chloroquine has side effects. And now you even take that in a combination with an antibiotics which has severe cardiac side effects and this is even enhanced by chloroquine because it has the same side effects. So it's quite risky uh, to kill the patients due to a cardiac side effect um, if you don't have any e relevant effect. And a very recent study suggests that it's indeed the case that the the real effect seems to be quite small. And in this case, unfortunately, you have to say it's not worth it to try. Now, the last slide I want to show you, or the question now we asked ourselves, if we can't trust Trump, who should we trust? Who should, whom should we li listen to? So there are so many experts now around all telling us things about COVID-19. So first of all, before doing that, uh, we need to think of what type of things are relevant for such a disease. One type, by the way, which is not on this uh, slide is, of course, hygiene. So general hygiene measures are important in order to block uh, the transmission. So hygiene uh, experts like my flatmate Dirk Bockmüll, of course, are important in this situation because they can tell you how to behave uh, in a general way in order to avoid infection. However, this hygiene stuff is more general. So it's not that uh, you need to study directly corona in order to give suggestions uh, with respect to hygiene measures which would work. Now come more tailored to COVID. Um, they are, there are in principle three main aspects of this uh, disease progression and so on you need to look inside. So the one thing what we talked about now was drug development and obviously these are the virologists who know about this virus, who study that virus and uh, they are the experts in this field what drugs could be relevant. Another point is uh, the these are really the people who know about the drug development in general. So I worked in a pharmaceutical company just to tell you um, and we had three uh, pro products in the final phase three trial. I had, uh, we had uh, one product, uh, Citra Relics, which was a um, LHRH antagonist and which was developed for benign prostatic hyperplasia, a huge market. It was in phase three trials. These phase three trials cost around $100 million. Uh, and all the initial studies, including the initial clinical studies looked very, very good. And I was in uh, Shanghai, uh, at the World Urology Congress and I had four posters uh, in this company with different in, uh, partners uh, demonstrating the mode of action, how uh, this works to um, uh, be effective against BPH, presented this poster and in parallel this phase three study completely failed, completely. There were in this study no effect. And if you come from the pharmaceutical industry, you have seen that very often. Only 10% of the drugs who start in phase one with very promising preclinical data survive it until the end. So this means that if you see data, if you see preclinical data, which is promising, of course one should go on. And especially in Corona, one should make as soon as possible trials to do that. However, uh, the experience teaches that many, many things don't, don't work. So it's important that these things are not overestimated and you wait until the first trials really give strong hints that these, um, it's, 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 um, you can really go for a broader treatment because don't, rem don't forget you always have side effects. So this is virology and let's say drug development. Now, the prediction how the epidemics um, will develop. These come from epidemiologists. 
Um, and these epidemiologists are ne not necessarily the same as the virologists. So virologists in general, uh, many of them have studied, um, for example, biology. And they have studied biology initially because they hate maths. And of course, for uh, for uh, understanding mode of actions and so on, uh, how viruses work, that's fine. But for epidemiological models, uh, I would go to uh, Sylvia Menekes, for example, because you need to have a mass brain uh, to understand this prediction. So these are different people in general. Um, uh, however, someone like Christian Drosten, for example, if you take Christian Drosten as an example, of course, he's a real expert in, in the field of coronavirus. So listening to him, It's a very good idea. And by the way, I really like to listen to him because you also see how science works. Science, typically, if there is a publication putting a new emphasis, uh, things will change. So also in the case of Christian Drosten, then he he will change based on data um, what he says. And this is typical, unusual for a society, for example. Uh, usually you see ideologists around which never change their opinion. And that's not good. This is not scientific. Yeah, If you see that there is data um, which hints to another direction and the data is strong, of course, you look at the data, you analyze the data because you are trained as a scientist to do that. You change your You, you, you come to up with a new conclusion out of the data. That's okay. Yeah. And if in a in a in a case like Corona where things are evolving so rapidly, this is normal. So someone like Christian Drosten, who had to change his mind a couple of times, he's a good scientist because he bases his opinion on data and not on what reading newspapers or so. If you're a scientist and if you're trained to read papers, I, I, you've seen before, I, we have read the paper together of him um, and we could interpret the data and we came to the same conclusion. Are we now corona experts? No, because um, what I said, you this, this chloroquine stuff, for example, if you don't know this, if you don't have this experience, this experience is missing, then this is lacking. So it's better to listen to the experts in the field uh, if you have them and we have luck to have one of them Christian Drosten um, then first listen to them it's not that other scientists cannot interpret data correctly but in this situation it's good if you have scientists which can really interpret the data now uh, epidemiologists are different people they are often physics or uh, they have studied physics or so so these modelings are usually other people. Christian Dross studied at the beginning, I think, chemical engineering. I think he was even at the same university with Frank Platte. And you know Frank Platte. This is mass chemical engineering. So I am quite sure that he also understands mass, but he would never claim to be an epidemiologist. That's that's nice. And if you add congresses, um, of course, you have also the people from the other fields. So this means, of course, as a virologist in this field, you have also an idea of the other fields. But the experts here are a different uh, type of people. And the same is true if you go to vaccine development. Vaccine development, you are in, in the field of immunology. So you are trained in immunology and know about vaccines. I'm coming from vaccine development, so I can judge um, the different developments in this field. I know the people who are now, uh, who started now the phase one trial. I even know the people from the... Uh, um, from the pay to the approval process. So this is something I can judge. I can judge uh, uh, the vaccine development, the virology. I can I can read the papers. Um, so this means in this case, um, of course, you should always listen to your professor as a student, but um, uh, the real expert, who is the real expert, it's not so easy to identify. And for each case, you need to, um, uh, to look at this. Now, If a politician then is, after reading two papers, an expert in virology, this is quite bizarre. But also, nevertheless, at the end, politics decides. So um, you don't, you you shouldn't forget. You shouldn't forget that um, if you say I lock down my complete society, this has, of course, a severe effect on 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 uh, on the society itself uh, this has a severe severe effect in economics and so on this cannot be decided by a, a virologist this cannot be decided by an epidemiologist this cannot be decided by an immunologist an immunologist can say the likelihood that this vaccine or this vaccine works is like this and that um, or it will be it's likely that we will have a vaccine in one year or not a virologist can say it's um 
we should to test this and that drug because uh, the preclinical data looks like this. And then it will, there will be, in, in medical field, they will start to try it. Uh, the epidemiologists can make predictions how the uh, disease is likely to progress and how measures can be uh, taken. But at the end, what to do needs to be decided by a politician, and this is good because we are in a democracy. Um, it's, it's not the virologist who can decide we now lock down uh, the society for five years and you would kill the complete... And of course, Christian Trosten doesn't want to do that. He says he's not the one who decides about the measure. He just advises on that. Yeah, um, it, The politician who is elected, he's in the position to listen to the scientific positions and then to decide. By the way, this is exactly the same for climate change. The data here is so clear. So there it's not much to discuss, but at the end still the politicians have to decide and you need to convince the population. So that's just about science and politics and the actual situation with Corona. Now I look at my watch. It is a quarter to 10. So we're exactly in time, at least based on my watch, maybe your watch tells you something else. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the remaining day and looking forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye.